In the past four months, we have seen the chutzpah of the Obama administration as it waged war in Libya in utter disregard for the Constitution. The president took an oath to uphold the Constitution, and it makes clear that only the Congress can start wars. We have military folks on the ground in Libya, at sea, and in the skies who have bombed, destroyed, and killed. We have even tried to kill the head of the government, Colonel Gaddafi himself, but instead killed three of his grandchildren. But President Obama has set himself apart from his oath to uphold the Constitution. He believes that by redefining words, he says, dropping bombs on a foreign government in concert with the military forces of another country does not constitute war because no American has been killed, he can do as he wishes. Of course, he has no authorization whatsoever from the Congress. He spent close to $100 million on this war, which he borrowed from the Federal Reserve and the Chinese, and the Congress is doing nothing to stop him. Sure. Um, a little bit of breaking news, actually. Mm -hmm. um, the New York Times just posted on their website a bit of a bombshell that's going to be in tomorrow's paper. Uh, it says that Dick Cheney demanded to send our military, the Army, into Buffalo, New York to arrest people in wow. 2002, um, in the words of the New York Times, to test the Constitution, literally to demonstrate that the Constitution no longer applied anymore. Yeah, we keep hearing these reports, and, and you know, it is very disconcerting when, when you hear these things. And I certainly agree with the caller, too, about the, the way that our Fourth Amendment has been eviscerated and our First Amendment and, uh, is, you know, in the Second Amendment, many in, in infringements as well. And he's exactly right uh, about that. And I am extremely concerned as well. Uh, in the name of the war on terror, we're sacrificing and abrogating our own freedoms right here in the United States. What good does it do to try to, quote, export democracy, close quote, around the world and then take away the rights and freedoms of the American people here at home. For example, I think we need to, to get rid of the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act is an abysmal affront upon constitutional protection of liberty, especially the Fourth Amendment protections. Uh, as he said, they're just about gone. Uh, we have a situation developing in the United States where it's almost as if we're, we're infatuated with police state mentality here in this country. The increase of the federal police role in, in, in our country is very alarming. Uh, uh, law enforcement is the responsibility of the states and the local communities, not the responsibility of the federal government. And yet we see an increasing militarization of our police. We see our, our law enforcement increasingly being used for, for federal uh, purposes and not not necessarily for the states and the local communities. Uh, we find the federal government that is usurping the, the states and local communities and laws and local law enforcement, et cetera. These things are very real, and, and they, are very, they should be very con, uh, con, disconcerting to the American people. And I really believe that Caller is absolutely right, that if we don't start standing up for these freedoms and these principles right now in 2008, uh, I believe that we are very, very soon to see the erosion, if not the, the end of our constitutional republic as we have known it. I'm Jackie Andrew Napolitano, and the verdict is in on a nation of sheep. Here's the question. Should Americans continue to sit back passively and allow the government to fleece away our freedom? Or is it time to become wolves and fight for our rights? Here are the facts. Freedom of speech is a God-given right absolutely protected by the United States Constitution in the First Amendment. But ever since the Patriot Act was signed into law, this freedom has been severely diminished. No longer can you be completely open with your significant other. No longer can you share all of your innermost secrets with your priest in the privacy of the confessional. No longer can you share confidential details with your personal attorney who may need that information in order to defend you adequately in a court of law. For the first time in 230 years, a law exists that prevents Americans from exercising these most basic rights. Violate this law, and under the Patriot Act, you could find yourself spending up to five years behind bars. What is it exactly that you're not allowed to share? If the FBI shows up on your doorstep tomorrow with a self-written search warrant to seize personal items from your home, legally you are not allowed to tell anyone about that warrant. Even though the Constitution says only judges can issue search warrants, the Patriot Act lets federal agents write their own. If you receive one, you cannot ask a federal judge, even though that judge was unconstitutionally surpassed in the warrant issuing process in the first place.
You cannot tell your lawyer in the hopes that he or she might be able to challenge the seizure as unlawful. You cannot even tell your significant other. Barack Obama, what are your thoughts on the Declaration well, of Constitution? You know, I, I, I think it's a remarkable document. Uh, I think uh, which one uh, the, the original Constitution uh, as well as as well as the uh, Civil War amendments but I think it is an imperfect document and I think it is a document that reflects uh, some deep flaws uh, in uh, American culture the, the colonial culture nascent at that time I'm Judge Andrew Napolitano, and the verdict is in on presidents ignoring the Constitution. Here's the question. Is the government we have today what the founders had in mind? Here are the facts. In a radio interview in 2001, then-Illinois State Senator Barack Obama noted somewhat ruefully that the same Supreme Court that ordered political and educational equality in the 1960s and 70s did not bring about economic equality as well. Although Senator Obama said he could come up with arguments for the constitutionality of such action, the plain meaning of the Constitution quite obviously prohibits it. During the past month, Senator John McCain, who, like Senator Obama, voted in favor of a $700 billion bank bailout, has been advocating that $300 billion of it be spent to pay the monthly mortgage payments of those in danger of foreclosure. The federal government is legally powerless to do that as well. And no less a figure than Franklin Roosevelt once called the Constitution quaint and from the horse and buggy era. Either Senator Obama or Senator McCain will soon take the oath of office to uphold that old-fashioned document, the one from which all presidential powers come. Everyone in government takes an oath to uphold the Constitution, but few do so. Beginning with John Adams and proceeding to Abraham Lincoln, Woodrow Wilson, and George W. Bush, Congress has enacted and the President has signed laws that have criminalized political speech, suspended habeas corpus, compelled support for war, forbade the freedom of contract, allowed the government to spy on Americans without a search warrant, and used taxpayer dollars to shore up failing private banks. All of this legislation is so obviously in conflict with the plain words of the Constitution that one wonders how Congress gets away with it. The truth is that the Constitution grants Congress 17 specific delegated powers, and it commands in the Ninth and Tenth Amendments that the powers not articulated and thus not delegated by the Constitution to the Congress must be reserved to the states and to the people. What's more, Congress can only use its delegated powers to legislate for what we call the general welfare, meaning it cannot spend tax dollars on individuals or selected groups, but only for all of us. And Congress cannot deny the equal protection of the laws. Thus, it must treat similarly situated entities in a similar manner. It is clear that the framers wrote a constitution as a result of which contracts would be enforced, risk would be real, choices would be free and have consequences, and private property would be sacrosanct. The $700 billion bailout of large banks that Congress recently enacted runs afoul of virtually all these constitutional principles. Do the people we send to the federal government recognize any limits on Congress's power to legislate. Here's my opinion. They don't recognize limits on Congress's power to legislate. The air you breathe, the water you drink, the size of your toilet tank, the water pressure in your shower, the subjects your children study in school, the manner in which your physician treats you when you're ill, the speed you drive your car, what you can drink before you get in the car. All of these are regulated by the Congress. Congress has written over 4,000 criminal laws that take up over 1 million pages of text. And the law presumes that we understand all of it. 
Does the Congress recognize any limits on its ability to legislate whatever it wants? Yes, whatever it can get away with. Um, it, this is not conservatism, what they have. It's a, it, they, pretend, they pretend to be conservatives, but they have torn the conserve out of conservatism. They, I, you know, all of the things like a, a, a free market capitalism, which they hate, you know, they want corporate crony capitalism and, and, uh, uh, and they want capitalism for the poor and socialism for the rich and, uh, and, they, and, and, you know, and separation of church and state, which was one of the pillars of conservative protection of the Constitution, which uh, Goldwater considered, you know, was absolutely reverential about the Constitution. But these people have torn, destroyed the Constitution. We are now torturing people in this country. We are wiretapping our citizens. We are, uh, we are, we've suspended the 820-year-old right of habeas corpus. We've suspended our protections against search and seizure. And it's the biggest bunch of, of baloney when they say to us, oh, well, you know, we live in dangerous times. This is why, if you really look at it, and I have friends who died in the World Trade Center attack. My offices were destroyed in that, that attack. But objectively, we live in one of the safest times in the history of this planet, you know, for Americans. Because when I was a little boy, you know, and we had 15,000 nuclear-tipped warheads in Russia pointing at our country, each one able to destroy an entire city. That was dangerous times, but we didn't wiretap our citizens. We didn't torture people then. You know, we didn't suspend habeas corpus. We didn't uh, try to send people to Guantanamo or do extraordinary renditions to torture people in Syria. You know, during the Civil War, during the Civil War, You know, we lost entire cities, 640,000 Americans, not 3,000, 640,000 were killed. It's the equivalent of 6 million people being killed today. And Abraham Lincoln said, when, when they talked about torturing so Southerners or mistreating them, he, he drafted a document for how we treat prisoners, and it later became the Geneva Convention, because he said, we are not going to do that as Americans. When George Washington was confronted with the British, during the, the Revolutionary War, torturing American prisoners, keeping them on coffin ships right here in New York Harbor where they're dying by the score every day. Washington said, we're not going to do that. If that's what we're going to do, then, then I'm not going to be part of this conflict. And he treated, he passed orders treating prisoners so well that when he captured Trenton, New Jersey, Trent, the, the barracks of Trenton, the Hessians were so astounded by the good treatment that they had received from the Americans that they walked all the way from New Jersey to Western Pennsylvania with no guards because of, and Dwight Eisenhower during World War II again said no matter what the Nazis do we are not going to torture them and that's one of the reasons the Nazis gave up the Germans gave up so quickly to us because they knew they were going to be treated well by Americans